No, no, no. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who's joined us on this webinar this afternoon. This webinar comes to you from the Hull Deformity course, which we hold every year in the UK. And this course is run by Professor Haman Sharma, who's joining me today as a moderator, and myself. And we have two expert uh, faculty members who have supported us for many years, who will be uh, giving us these presentations on the topic of uh, introductory lengthening nails today. I think it's very topical, it's very current, and certainly is a technique that's allowed us to really advance um, limb reconstruction and uh, deformity correction. So this afternoon, I think the plan is to have sort of two sections. We have a first section whereby we'll be looking at uh, deformity planning and length issues. Um, and then the second session where we're looking at the use of introductory nails and some tips and tricks and cases, and hopefully be able to answer some questions towards the end, given whatever time span we have. So I'm very much looking forward to these topics this afternoon. I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Dave Goodyear, Mr. Pete Calder, uh, who are from Stanmore um, and are our experts for this afternoon. So um, without much ado, coming to you live from the Stanmore Clinic in England. Uh, Dave, would you like to take, um, take it forward? Great, thank you very much for those kind words, Gavin. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm David Goodyear, Pete Calder here is my colleague. Uh, we thought we'd start off as it is the uh, the deformity course, a lot of the deformity course about planning. So I was going to talk a little bit about deformity and problems of length in terms of planning. And then Pete is going to talk about intramedullary devices and their use. Uh, we've got a lot of experience of those in the UK, particularly here. So uh, deformity and problems of length. Basically, this is teaching grammar to suck eggs, deformity parameters, angulation, rotation, which is really an angulation transverse plane, and translation. Not forgetting the shortening, it's just translation in the axial plane. Uh, lower limb shortening, either a single bone or multiple segments, and can be associated with other deformities, but it usually results in a limb length discrepancy. And we know from several studies that uncompensated leg length discrepancies of more than 10 mil cause back pain. Uh, Bilateral shortening, well, this is not really within the remit here. Bilateral shortening can be a severe functional problem for those with dwarfism. Uh, the whole issue of cosmetic lengthening for preventable psychological harm is, again, out with this talk. So we're not going to talk about what significant short stature is. But most of my interest in unilateral shortening. Now, this can either be from birth, congenital, for example, proximal femoral focal deficiency, DDH causes shortening, fibular hemimelia. Or it can be developmental, i.e. an injury where you get a relative difference in growth between the two limbs, for example, a growth plate injury, or even truly post-fracture post where you get true shortening. But you can also get relative shortening due to angular malunions, and normally once developed, these aren't usually progressive. Uh, obviously, if you get a post-traumatic injury in a child, you may get progressive shortening or progressive deformity, for example, a cousin fraction of the proximal tibia. And the other things to consider is you may get a leg length discrepancy uh, later on in life, hip arthritis, uh, positioning of total hip replacements can give rise to limb length discrepancies, some of which warrant treatment. Measurement, well, clinically, obviously, we all know how to check leg lengths. Uh, if it's short, you can assess which segment it's in the femur or the tibia by a Galeazzi test. If it's in the femur, you can find out if it's above or below the trochanter. In neonates, you're obviously assessing skin creases with DDH. And in adults, we're generally looking at gaits. We're looking at fixed contractures, particularly around the hip. You can often see people with apparent leg length discrepancies due to fixed abduction or adduction contractures around the hip or pelvic obliquity due to scoliosis. And these are important because if you just look at the length, you know, in classic deformity planning terms between the center of the hip and the center of the ankle and call that your leg length, then if you correct that and they've got fixed deformities, you're causing trouble. Uh, the other thing to consider is in deformity planning, we tend to look at angles and translations. Angles aren't changed by magnification. So it doesn't make any difference whether you're looking at a picture in a book or a planning book at sort of one fifth magnification and x-ray, but translations are different. Translations are measured in, well, what do you measure in millimeters usually in this part of the world. Uh, and obviously you get magnification errors. This is if you've got point source x-ray beams, they increase ma cause magnification errors. Now calibration markers reduce this, but don't necessarily obliterate it. And the other thing to consider is if you're projecting a deformity onto a plane film, for example, if the femur is flexed, so the knee is closer than the hip, it'll cause relatively short shortening of that segment. Okay. 
And the other thing to consider in length length is the discrepancy isn't just, as we normally do, deformity planning between the center of the hip and the center of the ankle. You need to consider the height of the foot, the height of the pelvis, contribution of angular deformity to length as part of your planning. And there are also specific pediatric considerations. You have to predict future growth. So this is, this is a simple example of you know, the closer the beam is, the more relative magnification you're going to get on your plate. So you need to consider beam length and fairly standardize that between your x-rays. And as I say, a calibration ball does help, but obviously a calibration ball on the front of a patient, particularly if that patient is obese, will cause a difference in magnification. And that difference is accentuated if it's eccentric because it's got a longer distance to pass to the plate if it's not sitting fairly central within the beam. So calibration markers assist but do not obliterate problems of magnification. And this is something we hark back to in our limb length, in our deformity planning course, the standardized long leg radiograph. And normally the radiographer or the surgeon would consider the anterior superior alex spines to be level and then take a shot there. And again, if you measure from the center of the femoral heads to the center of the ankles, that gives us a beautiful view of alignment. This is the, the axis test for mechanical axis deviation, and it's, it's fine. But if you do have a global limb developmental delay and a global shortening on one side, or indeed a hemi-hypertrophy on the other side cause a limb length inequality, then you have to consider relative contributions of the foot and indeed the pelvis to that. So you need to measure each segment separately. The relative height of the pelvis, the spine, relative height of the femur, the relative length of the tibia, and the relative height of the foot. Because even something such as subtalar fusion or a plano valgus foot will significantly alter leg length discrepancy out with those standard measurements. And as I say, contractures cause foreshortening of the limb. This is Amstutz's method for calculation of this, where you take the hip flexion angle and the knee flexion angle, and you can work out from some simple trigonometry the true length of the relatively foreshortened x-ray. You can also do a similar thing post-operatively. Quite often, I say quite often, quite often in my practice, you may see people with a relative foreshortening because they're developing a little bit of knee flexion or don't like locking out straight. Now, in this example, if the femurs were once the same length, so on this pre-op radiograph on the left, you've got femurs of the same length but a different tibial length. During the procedure, you then know that that femur was once the same length. Because the magnification area is usually distributed between the two bones, you can use the relative femoral length to work out what the actual true tibial length is, taking into account the foreshortening. Simple trig over there. You also need to consider compensations. An equinus ankle is not uncommon in people with a leg length discrepancy. A postural scoliosis is not uncommon, but you may consider a postural scoliosis to be correctable. You correct their leg length and yes, their spine comes straight, but they've been walking with that scoliosis for many years, perhaps, and you might not be doing them any favors. They may have months and months of physio ahead of them to accommodate to that new thing. Uh, the other th thing is to consider is correction of angulations may affect length. And it's also you've got to consider the stretching of soft tissues. Uh, angular correction or lengthening obviously stretches neurovascular structures, of which in the lower limb, the sciatic nerve or lateral popliteal nerve, are the most important, but also these musculotendinous injuries. Uh, injury stretching. So your quads get tight, leading to anterior knee pain. If you're not careful, you get joint subluxations. And this is particularly important in the pediatric population where they may have abnormal limb, uh, abnormal knee ligaments combined with lengthening. And people mentioned a bit about that as well. The other thing you've got to consider is what's going to happen in the future. If you compensate for someone with a severe avascular necrosis flattened hip and you equalize their leg lengths, when it comes to hip replacement, that may need further shortening taken into account. You've also got to consider in the growing child whether you do contralateral growth modulation and epiphysiodesis. This is an example of how this is a simple straightening. The proximal and distal femoral lengths are exactly the same, but the relative height of the legs is very different. And just correcting the angulation corrects the length. So measuring each segment and planning each segment separately during your planning is essential to make sure you get things right. The other thing that's often not considered in terms of lengthening is people think that a closing wedge osteotomy doesn't cause lengthening. Now, if your hinge point is on the medial side of this tibia here, and you do an opening wedge, the fibula, and thus the lateral popliteal nerve, the muscles on the outer side causing potentially problems with clawing, will get lengthened quite a significant amount. If you do a closing wedge, because the hinge point is on the lateral border of the tibia, the fibula being even further lateral still opens. 
it's not as much, but you will still get stretching there. So doing these things acutely, particularly an opening wedge acutely is causing a lot of stretching. You may want to consider doing something more slowly and gradually by external fixation in those scenarios. Pediatric considerations, well, you've got to consider the leg length discrepancy will change with growth. So you've got the leg length at the time of measurement. You've got the leg length if you operate it on a particular time point and what will happen in the future. And the leg length if you do then arrest the contralateral side or delay it. And I say arrest or delay because you can do either an epiphysis or something similar to eight plates to slow it, which gives you some modulation control in theory. Whether that's true in practice or not varies between opinions. You do need to be able to project future growth for this, and that's not always linear. And it also can depend on the underlying condition, if you've got a malnutrition, if you've got other problems, if you've got problems causing angular, angular change in the bones, for example, the hyperphosphatemic rickets. So a single measurement on its own is not usually useful. So you can plot these things on charts to predict future growth. And uh, this is it's not actually from Gorilla Compile, but it shows the differences between 2, 4, 7, 10, 14, and an adult wrist in terms of development. And there are atlases. The classic one is the uh, Gruley Compile Atlas. There are other more modern ones. And there's loads of papers out there about particular techniques, more modern methods of looking at this, but they basically revolve on checking bone age, usually from the hand and sometimes from the neck, and comparing it against standards to give you some idea of skeletal development. You also need to consider what's going on with the rest of it in terms of weight and height, plot these on standard charts, the World Health Organization provides standard charts where you can actually plot what growth is going to be like. And based on those, you can predict what you're going to do. The aim being to end up with skeletal length, length equality at skeletal maturity. And that might mean multiple treatment episodes. You know, if you're going to leave a child short for most of its development just so you can do a single point episode, they may not learn to walk properly. On the other hand, doing multiple operations all the way through may give them a more even leg length through their development, but take them out of schooling more frequently. You may want to give them full leg lengths by lengthening the short side. You may want to do growth modulation the opposite side. So there's a lot of consideration of where this has actually subtly changed since discovering the relative safety of limb lengthening devices, intermediate limb lengthening devices in adolescence, and we've published on that recently. Uh, adult planning. Well, one thing to consider is the limb axis. Uh, if you're overall varus or valgus, it may tend to exaggerate it. She has too many Gs in there. Uh, and we do know that femoral lengthening in the anatomical axis can cause valgus. Now, whether that's clinically relevant or not depends on the amount you're doing and where their axis started with. So you can lengthen the mechanical axis, but that's generally done with external fixation. Or you can do intermedullary lengthening, but it may be that if you're going to do a long distance and you're worried about valgus malalignment, you can actually do an acute varus correction, hold it there with polar blocking screws to start with. And this is what I'm on about. So if you lengthen a short limb here, if you lengthen a mechanical axis, you end up with a femur that goes down at seven degrees, straight down the line of the axis, then back at seven degrees. So you get a very zigzag femur that may make it subsequently different to intramedullary lengthen or intramedullary fix. Whereas if you lengthen the anatomical axis, what happens is the knee gets pushed to the medial side by lengthening in the, this axis, leaving you with an overall valgus. Now that's quite subtle in this particular drawn example. But as I say, it's been roughly calculated about a degree per centimetre in adults. The actual numbers, it's a percentage rather than a number because it all depends how tall the adult is to start with. Uh, what choice have you got? Well, these are our options. We can do a contralateral shortening osteotomy. And certainly I've done this before in people with significant height issues. I had one bloke who was nearly seven foot. We took out, shortened both femurs, one more than the other. Uh, you can lengthen the short side by external fixation. And your choices there are unilateral or circular. Certainly, circular fixation of the femur are a miserable experience. Uh, the tibia was put just under the skin so it could have an external fixator, so it's probably easiest. Intramedullary lengthening implants, well, they're kind of the reverse. Intramedullary lengthening implants seem to work better in the femur because the muscle bulk is balanced around it rather than the tibia, where the muscle bulk is eccentrically lateral and posterior and could lead to bending if you're not careful. Uh, and because of those reasons, selection of the segment is not always doing the shortest segment. It is not unreasonable in small degrees of lengthening to lengthen a femur for a post-traumatic tibial shortening, for example, particularly if the soft tissues have had multiple episodes of plastic surgery. And it's not unreasonable to do the reverse and lengthen the tibia by external fixation if the femur has had previous problems and is short. 
the, the key is to get leg length equality at the end of treatment. You may end up with different knee heights, but function isn't necessarily a problem, although it may be cosmetically. So this is just finishing with a little example to cover most of those points. This is a patient with an atrophic non-union of the proximal femur, uh, sustained as a child, now patient in his 30s, having had multiple operations with broken metalwork. Remove the metalwork, wait for it, nail it. It's actually a humeral nail. Uh, and then wait for that to unite. When it unites, this is a classic shatterotomy, not a neat socket corticotomy, with an LRS rail external fixator, and you can stretch them out. Once they're stretched out, obviously the lengthening is going to come off the end of the nail, but the nail guides the regenerate. And then at the end of that, you can then swap that out for a slightly longer nail. This is a pediatric, pediatric uh, femoral nail. And then you can fix it and wait for that to mature. But he's still very, very short. But luckily, he's now within the range of intramedullary lengthening implants. So you can actually lengthen them out even further with an intramedullary lengthening device. So you can do both in one patient. You can do all sorts of things, intermedullary, extramedullary, do what you like. But the most important thing is to know what you're doing and plan it to start with. And remember, as a colleague of mine in Sheffield once said, no one ever died of a shoe raise. So you've got to think long and hard about these patients, but then make your choice between intermedullary and extramedullary implantation. So I don't know whether you want to take questions there or hand over to Pete. It's probably easier if I hand over to Pete to talk about intramedullary lengthening implants and then we can take questions on both at the end. Would that be right, Gavin? Or how do you want to play um, it? That was, that was great, Dave. I think a lot of information there and hopefully everybody followed all that. Um, obviously, this will be available to view again to a later stage, probably on YouTube at some point, if you want to go over some of these lectures. Uh, that was excellent. Yeah, I think if we uh, go now, I think there are no particular open questions available at this moment in time. Um, Pete, if you go with your talk, and then we'll come back to questions and answers at the end again. Okay, so plug Pete in. So just while we're setting that up, if anybody does have any questions, um, do put them up in the question and answer box and we'll try and get to them uh, later on uh, in, in this webinar. Have you got that there, Gavin? <clears throat> okay. Hello, shall I crack on? Yep, crack on, thanks Pete. All right, hello everybody. Um, so here we go then. Um, first thing to do is apologize for anybody who's seen a lot of this talk before. There's not really a lot new, but for those who haven't seen it, I'm hoping that I can give you some tips and tricks. This is from what we have uh, gained from our experience here between David and I um, over the years. So um, let's start with distraction osteogenesis. Um, we talked a little bit about lengthening and David's shown in that last case that obviously we can, with the tension across the tissues, we can regenerate bone and soft tissue. And it's almost 30 years now since Elizaroff published in the English literature. And in the 50s, he published his original Russian literature. Uh, and we know that we need stability of bone, um, how we do our corticotomy, the rate of distraction and the rate of, and the rhythm of distraction is what we need to create good bone and obviously traditionally that was done with the external fixator uh, but we know that there are pitfalls of external fixation infection joint stiffness regenerate deformity when you take the frame off late fracture and then also the psychological impact of having a frame on your limb for quite a long time so we needed to look at other methods and femoral lengthening over an intermediary nail became quite popular and this is the original paper from Paley and Herzenberg's unit um, when he was, when they were together at Baltimore. And David's shown this example already um, where he's lengthened over a nail um, to reduce the time that the fixator was on. And in fact, we've um, used this uh, where we've put a deliberately long nail into the piriformis, through the piriformis fossa into the buttock when we've been dealing with femoral non-unions. We've published that recently. So it works, um, but there are obviously risks because you still have an external fixation and you have an intermedullary implant as well. So the holy grail has taken us to the intermedullary limb lengthening nail. And you can see that there are several nails that have been put on the market. Uh, I have some experience of these nails. I've not had any experience with the fit bone, which has um, uh, a cutaneous sensor that goes under the skin 
um, that you put an electrical signal through to make it uh, uh, work. Uh, it was not licensed in the United Kingdom at the time. I think it is now, uh, but subsequently I have had some experience with the ISKD, the intermodullary skeletal kinetic distractor. I've looked after patients, the Bliskanov nail, arguably one of the first uh, ratchet type nails came from the Ukraine and the Albizia nail uh, comes from uh, France with uh, Guichet. And I believe he's got his own nail now, which is a similar design. Uh, and a similar effect. So how do these ratchet uh, nails work? Well, obviously you make an osteotomy, you click the nail, the nail gets longer and it extends the limb. The problem is you have to rotate the, uh, the bone around the nail, so it can become quite painful. The Blushkinov actually, as you saw in the previous diagram, um, has a connection uh, to the iliac wing, which gives it stability to allow rotation. So obviously that's an issue. And what you could see here is that there's um, some heterotopic bone around the proximal end of the nail. And this is when I removed it, when a patient came back from previous lengthening. The bits here again has got this ratchet system. Um, and if you look at the evidence in the literature, there are some difficulties with patients needing general anesthetic to allow the rotation. Uh, and the other main issue is you can't go backwards. So once you've gone forwards, if you've got a problem with um, soft tissue contracture or nerve injury, then you can't go backwards and you have to accept where you are. Similar with the ISKD, uh, the benefit of this was that the rotation uh, was less, so you only had to rotate your limb around to approximately 45 degrees from the neutral in the medial and lateral plane. Um, and again, there were some issues with this about um, premature consolidation and also runaway nails where the patients would wake up uh, after a night's sleep finding that they'd lengthened two centimeters during the night. And again, the main issue is getting the nail to go backwards. That was a problem. And you can see here where we've got successful. And I did a few of those at the beginning of my career. So along came then the precise intermodality lengthening system. And this is the one that we use most of all at the moment. And it uses the technology used in the magic rod for scoliosis um, growing uh, modulation, uh, where you put a magnet over the top, uh, rotate the magnets rotate around. You can see this where I'm holding it on the patient's limb um, in the bottom picture. That causes a rotation of the magnet within the nail, which drives the motor forward and pushes out the threaded rod. The beauty of this is obviously if you reverse the rotation of the magnets, you reverse the rotation of the magnet in the nail and you can reverse the nail. So we first put um, a nail in in 2012 and we've had some experience since then. So the learning objectives of this particular um, talk is to look at the patient position and incision, osteotomy levels and how we do it, whether we need soft tissue releases, how we lock, the rate and rhythm of distraction, and then looking at complications that we've had and how to avoid them. So I bring you to this person. He's no relative of mine, even though people seem to like take the mick all the time. And I'd like to stay home, protect the NHS and save lives. So it seems to be something that we do in threes. But I'd like to take you to another uh, Prime Minister and use this quote, because I think this is the biggest tip I can give you, which is education, education, education. And I really do believe that to get a success in limb lengthening with the intermediary nail, you need an excellent team. And we have a multidisciplinary approach here at the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital uh, with ourselves, the surgeons, clinical nurse specialists. We have specific physiotherapists dedicated to limb reconstruction, occupational therapists. And we also have access to uh, pediatric psychologists. We have psychiatrists who are involved with our patients and pain specialists who can help in difficult times. The other thing I would suggest is you have an amazing secretary because these people do tend to phone up a lot and they do need access to people and information. Um, information leads to expectation. The expectation involves what the patient wants but also what we want as a team. And so, you know, we need to tell the patients what we expect them to give to us during their treatment, which is, you know, how they're going to do their physiotherapy, how they're going to look after the nail, how they're going to mobilize, et cetera. And we have a lot of pamphlets here uh, that deal with those. Um, if we look at limb reconstruction itself, these pamphlets, you can actually go on the website for the hospital, 
go on to the limb reconstruction um, part and you can download these PDFs if you want and use them for your patients if you, if you want. You know, you can do your own. You can just look at ours and make changes as you, as you feel fit. And you can see we've got one for external fixation, pin site, and also uh, lower limb lengthening. For the children, you know, the, this hospital, uh, we uh, have a, a very nice saying from cradle to grave. And so, you know, for, we've got pediatric acute pain services and also transition. A lot of these people who have limb lengthening will be adolescent uh, children. And it's a really important time in their lives and how they're going to transition from being children to adults. Um, and then from the adult perspective, obviously smoking, major issue. Uh, you know, we need to look at the whole patient, not just the bone that we're lengthening. So if we go back to our learning objectives, uh, let's talk about the nail. So if we look at the precise nail, you can see that they come in three diameters, 8.5, 10.7, 12.5, and they come in different lengths. And it's important to note that, you know, if you have the smaller limb, I don't think they do 230s anymore, in fact, um, well, certainly not in the United Kingdom here, uh, you can only lengthen up to five centimeters. And there are even smaller ones that you can lengthen up to three centimeters. But if you go over two, four, five, you can lengthen up up to eight centimeters. That means up to eight centimeters. It doesn't mean you have to go to eight centimeters. The same laws of limb lengthening apply with soft tissue contracture and tolerance, etc. For the anti-grade nails, I, you can either use a traction table standard approach, or you can put them in a sloppy lateral uh, and use x-ray uh, with free hand with a sandbag. Um, it's a kind of a percutaneous procedure. Um, so remember the anterior bow, apex 10 degree amp of bow of the femur, and this is a straight nail, but the nail is acting as a lengthening device rather than the mechanical properties of a trauma nail. So it doesn't have to fill the whole diameter of the femur. In some cases, we don't want to do that at all. So where do we put our entry point? So it's a straight nail. So if you go centrally, you may well hit the anterior cortex. So it may be worthwhile going a little bit anterior in, in your threaded pin, okay? When you put the nail in, you can accept a little bit of gull wing in to get the straight nail in. So a lot of the times it, it, when we originally started, we tried to ream up, put the nail straight in. But what we found was we couldn't get the nail down the diameter. So we thought we had to ream up more. We would only ream up two millimeters in a precise nail larger than the nail diameter or approximately. So for a 10.7, I'd go 12.5. For 12.5, I'd go 14.5. I don't think you need to go any more than that. So what may happen is the deformity of the bone may mean that you would have to complete the osteotomy and then pass the nail down. And here you can see an example where we're touching the posterior cortex proximally and the anterior cortex distally. And that's quite important, especially when you talk about the distal locking, which we'll cover in a minute. So here we go, we put a guide wire down. David advised me a great tip, which is once you've got the guide wire down, just pass the front cutting reamer once up and down. It cuts out a nine millimeter track and that makes it really easy to put your, your ball tip guide wire down again after you've done it. So here's your percutaneous approach, and here's me, you know, pre-drilling my osteotomy. Derotation pins. Some people swear by them, other people don't. If I'm doing it on a traction table for a simple, straightforward lengthening, because we're holding the bone, I don't expect to be disrupting the osteotomy too much. I don't think you need them, but if you want to put them in, you can. Um, when do you put them in? Well, you can put them in with the nail in place in the proximal and distal. If you put a retrograde nail in or a prox an antegrade, put the nail in, then put your derotation pin next to the nail. And then you can put the second derotation pin distal to the end of the nail, which you can measure on, on the actual skin. Put something robust in, at least 2.5 millimeters, because otherwise, if you put a 1.6 millimeter K wire, it'll just bend. If you want to do derotation as part of your deformity correction, put something bigger in. I use a four millimeter half pin, proximal and distal, so I can get a real good grip of the bone, do the osteotomy, and then correct around the nail once I've got the rotation that I want. How do I do the osteotomy? Just a you know, straightforward De Bastiani technique, pre-drill osteotomy. Here's an example in the femur. Here's an example in the tibia. Very, very straightforward, nothing special. So I'm pre-drilling. I pre-drill before I do the reaming. Here I am doing the osteotomy. And the important thing of this slide is, oh, what have I done? Sorry. 
Uh, no, no. Uh, oh my goodness. All right, that's all right. all right. Got it. What have I done? The important thing of this slide is this area here. The, the nail is up to the osteotomy. So once you've done the osteotomy, the proximal femur doesn't spring into flexion and abduction. Otherwise, you might find it difficult to get your nail in. So just put your nail in down to the osteotomy, complete your osteotomy, and then push it gently across. You shouldn't need to hammer it down. When you're preparing the nail, put the, the, you're putting a bolt in. The bolt um, fills the whole of the hole. There's no gap between the bolt and the nail, so you need to be accurate. So what I do is I put my drill into the nail, then I tighten the proximal end uh, of the nut before I put the nail in. So you don't actually twist the nail around and maintain alignment. When you've completed lengthening, there is some formally to work out um, how many centimeters you add on and where you put your osteotomy, et cetera, et cetera. I tend to do it about 10 centimeters below the less trochanter, and it seems to be okay. And at the end of the operation, you want the larger diameter of the nail to be within the distal fragment by at least two centimeters or so. The weakest part of your construct is at the osteotomy line at this time before the bone has healed. And so that's the point where these titanium nails will bend. And that's the problem about weight bearing. You can do some weight bearing, but not more than 20 kilograms, because otherwise that nail can bend in that regenerate spot. Obviously, if you've got the thinner part of the nail in there, it will give you some mobility at that regenerate site, which could result in poor bone healing. And the other thing is that it's weaker still. So I would, you know, that's the advice. Don't, don't, you know, put the smaller bit into that area. What about soft tissue consideration? We found that if you lengthen greater than three or four centimeters, you end up with a, a abduction contracture from a tensor fascia lata. So we would release it in a transverse fashion and we do it at the site of the osteotomy. So if you're doing a, an anti-grade nail, I cut it at the um, level 10 centimeters below the less trochanter. If I'm doing a retrograde nail, I do it at the level of the junction of the distal diaphysis and metaphysis. In congenital short femur, obviously straight head of rectus is an advisable release. And if you've got knee contractures, hamstring releases or even posterior capsulotomy may be required. And I've only needed to do that in the early days. We watch it really closely at the moment and the physio helps a, lo a lot. What about distal locking? Okay, so think about the circle of the, of the femur. Think about where your actual nail is lying. And because it's placed more anterior, when you put your um, drill bit onto the bone, you have a tendency to slip up or slip down if you try and do the distal locking bolt. So I personally do the more proximal locking bolt first because I get a good position of the actual drill. Um, and I tend to use a pilot hole with a 2.5 millimeter drill bit that's because I'm just not as good as my colleague, Mr. Goodyear, who just does it with his eyes closed. Um, if you look at the drill, these are important points. Um, there's this spike at the end. And often you feel like you may well have gone through the opposite cortex, but actually you've only gone up to the actual main thread of the drill. So you need to go all the way through. And I'll explain why, because if you look at the boat length, ideally we want the boat length to go out completely the other side. But occasionally the actual boat doesn't engage and doesn't go through. And this is because you haven't drilled out the hole all the way through. And remember, it's a bolt. It doesn't screw in. It just pushes through. So if you're finding that you are trying to put the bolt in and you may not have drilled the opposite side, the other thing is that in the smaller nail, the 10.7, and especially um, the 8.5, the bolts are smaller diameter, but the threads are five millimeters. So often you could just use a five millimeter drill bit to open up the near cortex, uh, and that means the threads will engage and you'll find that you can screw the bolt down. If you don't, there is a tendency with the soft tissues rubbing over the bolt for it to migrate uh, outwards. But about how much fixation? Well, here you can see I had a spondyloepiphyseal uh, dysplasia. We had, two, we had, this was when we had the original nail on the, and you can see on the right-hand side, it's got two distal locking bolts, but then the new P2 nail came out, which was a little bit longer. And so we couldn't actually get a good fixed distally. So we only used one bolt, but as you can see, 
that went on to heal very well. So yeah, probably can get away with it, but it's probably better to be lucky than good. Um, you mark the magnet on the, on the X-ray, and here you can see that I am uh, using the magnet to correct it. And if you look at this stage, we've put all the actual kit away. Current practices, I lengthen the nail, keeping all the kit sterile, just in case the nail doesn't work. And we have to take the re-scrub, take the nail out and put a new nail in. Therefore, always have two nails, please, available, just in case one nail doesn't work. You um, look at the actual bushing, and you can see the washer here. I lengthen now only half a millimeter because all I want to see is if it's working. So I look at that, I get a DR shot with my image intensifier. There I'm looking and there you can see there's movement just after half a millimeter. All, all I'm looking for is to see a little opening to show that the, the actual magnet has worked. Trochanteric entry, especially in the pediatric population who have an open uh, proximal femoral uh, growth plate. Um, you, uh, how old can you put them in? If you look at the literature, Herzenberg has put them in uh, around the age of eight and below. There's a question that in eight-year-old female and 10-year-old male, the greater trochanter doesn't grow too much more. So that may be a safe time to put it in. But you've always got that risk of the blood supply to the femoral head. And again, it comes down to, well, do you feel lucky? Um, so most of the children I've done with the lengthening are around the age of about 12. And I use a trochanteric entry. Problem with the trochanteric entry, obviously, is that you hit the opposite cortex. So you may, unfortunately, need to tap this down a little bit to bounce it down when you've done your osteotomy. Uh, what do we do in the post-op period? Um, Six-day latency period immediate physiotherapy for hip and knee range of motion, partial weight bearing. In the congenital shorts with the um, ligament uh, absence, I use an extension brace, which they take off about three or four times a day to do their knee flexion exercises. I do it one third of a millimeter three times a day. No idea why. I, d I don't know why we started that, but we did. Um, and, but in the congenital shorts, I do it one third of a millimeter twice a day. We see them in the clinic every two weeks with x-rays and range of motion checks. And then once they've uh, reached their, limb, uh, their length, we then increase weight gradually, 25%, um, 50%, 75%, then 100% over four weeks, and I do another x-ray. If that shows good regenerate, I leave them go. If it shows poor regenerate, then we, I slow them up and we go back to partial weight bearing. Dave does it slightly differently, I believe, and he um, basically keeps some partial weight bearing, but increases it slightly until he sees a lot more regenerate. Um, but that's in the paper if you want to read that. Um, put the control on. You, in the more obese patients, you can change it to the lateral side of the limb. And obviously, look at the, the depth of the magnet, okay? This is quite important. So sometimes a, a retrograde femoral nail might be more appropriate because um, it, the proximal tissues are just too large. Um, and obviously you can get a, a shorter distance between the skin and the distal femur. So let's talk about distal femur. Um, I'm not sure if you're gonna have a lecture uh, by Professor Baumgart on reverse planning. That's an excellent paper, but we'll just show you an example. So this is a retrograde patient uh, with a valgus deformity. So what I've done is I've just done a standard um, retrograde approach, put a guide wire in, and what I wanna do is place my nail in that position, which gives it the anatomical axis following lengthening of where I've put, done my reverse planning. Uh, I've pre-drilled my osteotomy, um, and then what I've done is I'm just gonna use a fixator-assisted um, correction. So I've put in my posterior half pin, and I put an anterior half in, and what I've done is I've completed the osteotomy, and I'm using my osteotome to rotate the osteotomy and correct the angulation to the uh, position which I've calculated um, to be in at the time of the completed osteotomy and nail insertion. I've then fixed my uh, external fixator so that I can then put in my nail in that position. The nail's gone in, I've locked it, and I've put in a blocking screw just to maintain that position. Now, an alternative way of doing this is to uh, put the blocking screw in and not use an external fixator and just done reverse planning, just reamed up with the, banging against the screw. 
I think, you know, you do whichever way you think is, is the safest. So I've maintained my position when I've inserted my nail. And there you can see the completion of lengthening with a, um, a lateral distal femoral anatomical angle of 81 degrees. What about the more complex where you've got rotation as well as angulation? Here I would suggest using a hexapod system and the guys from Bristol um, have published on the chaos theory, computer hexapod assisted orthopedic surgery. Again, you can see the pins going either side in an angulatory um, approach of the patella that fixes into the distal femoral metaphysis. We've got two pins into the proximal femur with a hexapod in between. You complete your osteotomy, you correct your osteotomy, which can, um, you know, the, the rotation, the angulation, and then you can ream up, place your nail, fix your nail, and there you are with the post-op uh, correction, and there you are with seven, six centimeters of lengthening, which goes on to heal. And then finally in this group, here's a patient with a, a hip replacement, uh, he's a sickle cell, but you can see the size of his intermedullary canal is very large. So we did a, a normal approach, but here we use blocking screws um, to maintain the knee. But interestingly, there was still some movement, even though I'd locked the, the, the nail distally with two screws, I could wiggle the nail back and forth. So what we did is we put another locking screw in to maintain position. Then, then we did our osteotomy, completed the osteotomy through the three blocking screws. And we had a reasonable position, completion of lengthening, and then that went on and healed very nicely as well. So I'll lead on to congenital shorts, okay? The, the issue is there's multiple deformities of a congenital limb, as you are aware, uh, retroversion, um, hyperplasia of the lateral femoral condyle, absence of the cruciate ligaments, um, poor bone formation with the sclerotic rib-like bone. Um, so this patient's got a congenital limb. The whole limb is abnormal, so he'll have an associated fibula hemimelia uh, and foot deformities, um, coalition between the uh, calcaneum and the talus, absence of the cruciates, as we've said. So what I did with him, uh, this, this young man also, I didn't really trust him very much. So I wanted to bridge his knee during the limb lengthening. So he's got an intermodullary um, alignment in. We've bridged his knee. Uh, there's the, the fixation proximally and distally. Uh, there's the osteotomy. And then what you can do during the lengthening is you can remove the, just the bridging strut at the front. You've got the hinge in place so you can do knee flexion, which is great. But unfortunately, I made a slight error in judgment in that I only put two half pins distally and he kept on using the frame to rotate his leg around. So even though he was doing well lengthening, okay, after two and a half centimeters, he basically developed quite a lot of pain in his knee. And I was taught by Rob Hill that if patients point over their patella, that signifies subluxation of the knee and you must stop because the things are not right and you must address that. So if you look on the x-ray on the far right, you can see that the frame has rotated around those um, pins. So the angulation I had in those pins wasn't good enough. So what we did, uh, and you can see the posterior subluxation. So what we did was we went back um, a centimeter, took all the tension off the tissues, the knee came beautifully into full extension. And I took him back to theater, we had a long discussion and I fixed his knee in extension with no hinge movement. We then completed the six centimeters of lengthening with the knee maintained in extension. That went on to heal. And as you can see over the months, there was a bit of a delay, but you can see he had he got, that was after about two or three months after completion of lengthening. And now he has full range of motion. We then had the coronavirus pandemic, so I didn't see him till recently, but you can see that, that bone's really remodeled very well. And he's now at a position where we might consider doing another lengthening. So what I do now, especially with the children, is I put the nail in with the extension brace, but I make sure that I have enough distance between the distal end of the nail and the knee so that if they do go into subluxation, we have the opportunity to bridge it with a fixator and hold that knee either for further lengthening or to help with correction of the contracture. Tibia, we did some lengthening, uh, started in uh, 2015. Setup, you can, uh, I do it freehand like this. Um, I do fix the fibula always. I do pre-drill. 
and we put the nail in and we do one third of a millimeter twice a day due to the calf being um, quite tight. And six months later, the initial hypothesis was, hey, well, this works. Straight nail, straight lengthening. However, if you are a little bit critical, you can see that the fibula has migrated distally a little bit. And actually, there's a slight procovatum deformity. So we said, fine. Then, as David alluded to earlier, the soft tissues are acentric. And if we think back to our Elizaroff teachings, we know that regenerate in an Elizaroff frame will go into procovatum and valgus. And this is exactly what happened with this nail. And this was in Turner's syndrome. And so what I did, um, so was it a surgical error? Had my nail been put in over the medial tibial spine? So I put it into valgus to start with. Um, again, the procovatum. So I did a perineal nerve decompression, put a frame on, did a gradual correction. And you can monitor your nerve by doing it this way. And you can gradually correct it, keep the nerve stimulator on it to make sure it's working, and then put a, a trauma nail in, and that did well. So the second hypothesis was, well, we need to keep the nail straight. So we used lots of blocking wires, which were temporary, because it was my error. And then this case came along. And you'd argue that the, the nail is in a great position postoperatively. But look, he went into valgus. And if you look, this nail screw bolt has, not, has migrated out of the lateral cortex of the tibia. And the fibula hasn't actually opened up. So one might argue, should I have taken a bit of fibula out, etc. So with him, I did a gradual correction with the TSF because the fibula was short. And I was concerned um, that I might stretch the perineal nerve too much. We talk about proximal fibular migration. And a lot of these patients, they have a, a actually hyper, hyperplasia of the fibula and the fibula head is quite high. So actually in some, most patients, you want to pull it down. Uh, but in some of these patients, you can lock it with a screw. And there's various techniques where you can do it. Um, so now we need to keep the nail straight at all time. So you need to analyze your approach, whether you want to go medial parapetella versus tendon split. Do you need to do your osteotomy a little bit more distal? The problem is the more distal you go, uh, the more risk you have of delayed union. Uh, and then you put your bolts in at the front and the back. Um, when you do your osteotomy in the actual precise nail, watch out for the square area on the nail because it can catch on the screw and make reduction very difficult. Then you put it in. There's the locking bolt position. So the nail isn't right and left. It's a set position like this. So actually, you know, that's gone straight. If you look at this one, if you're clever, you can actually use the, the locking bolt to go into your fibula head as a fixation device. So here's a post-operative current uh, regime. And you can see it goes out quite nicely and keeps straight. And actually, since we've done that, we've had very few that have gone into valgus. So the question is proximal fibula fixation. What about joint contracture? What I'm finding is that they do tend to go into a bit of knee fix flexion. And I think it's because the fibula gets pulled down with the hamstrings and that causes you a little bit of um, tightness. So actually probably a proximal fibula fixation is worthwhile. But what about the other uh, locking bolts is the answer, the stride nail where you can weight bear and actually maintain your range of motion of knee and uh, ankle. And here's a stride nail going uh, straight down. They've got a much better locking configuration. So if we look at the stride, and this is the last bit, um, this is made of stainless steel. So you can actually weight bear. You can work more on normal gait patterns, more on, on uh, active stretch of your knee and ankle. You can see that they've got locking configurations. In the tibia, you've now got three locking screw um, options, especially with a transverse locking screw, which will stop it um, migrating into varus and valgus and also the screws have got threads on both ends so you can lock into both cortices so here's a patient first um, uh, follow-up she lengthened just under two centimeters she's have bilateral femoral stride here she is having completed five uh, just under five centimeters of lengthening so you can see it's a tentative walk but it's a full weight bearing at that follow-up look for range of motion. So you see got reasonable range of motion, a bit tight, but this is the important thing, the fixed flexion deformity, because they have this anterior um, pelvic tilt and the lumbar lordosis, which you need to address with physiotherapy. 
And here you can see seven months down the line, completed the six months with a much more normal gait pattern. With the, the tibia, uh, again, you can see much better full weight bearing, heel strike, toe off foot progression, uh, and that seems to be progressing quite nicely as well. And you can see with the locking configuration and the size of the nail, it's actually quite difficult to get locking bolt, uh, blocking bolts in. So, in finally, with discussion, education, 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 expectation of the patient, multidisciplinary approach. You need other people to help you, physios, OTs, the clinical nurse specialists, etc. The setup, we've talked about antegrade versus retrograde, traction table, entry points, uh, rate and rhythm, the knee and, and things that we can tips in uh, congenital. With the tibia again, entry points, proximal locking bolt configuration with uh, blocking screws, the osteotomy site, the polar position, the best positions, um, fib fibula fixation, and is, are we striding to the future? So thank you very much. I know that's about half an hour. Thank you for your attention. That's, uh, that was tremendous, uh, Pete. Uh, a great run through and some excellent cases and um, some wonderful tips and tricks from all your experience. And I think that really comes through is all that experience you've got uh, in picking up these um, tips and tricks. And I think hopefully everybody has learned a lot, not only in the planning, it, it is, does require planning. We often talk about these courses, deformity planning, um, you know, it's popularized by Baltimore. Planning is key before even going to the technical side of things um, of actually performing the procedure. And then in particular, looking after these patients afterwards, I think is also paramount of importance. I think as we learned from the original Lizarov method was that the rehabilitation is so important. Um, any, any particular points, um, Dave and Pete, that you want to sort of go over? We don't have any questions at the moment. Uh, bottom ones we have answered. If anybody else has any questions at the moment, at the bottom of your screen, there's a question and answer um, little bar, if you could tick it and uh, put any questions you may have to the faculty. It's a great opportunity. I mean, my, what about, if, if no one's got any questions, one of my statements, should we say, is that uh, a lot of intermediary limb length implants are commercially driven. The use thereof, it, it harks back to the early days, of the Taylor spatial frame, where I think it was a reasonable criticism of the companies that they would advertise these things as opening up the world of deformity correction to your ordinary orthopedic surgeon. One of the reasons I was so wanting to do the planning talk is that these are not things that you put in to make limbs longer. These are devices that are part of your armamentarium in deformity planning and correction. And I think it, it's, it's planning, planning, planning. And I try to emphasize the planning is not just drawing lines on radiographs. It's assessing the patients. It's assessing the compensatory contractures, deformities. It's planning when you do something in a child's life or an adolescent's life. It's making sure it's the right thing for them. I mean, we have, because it's fun, extended the indication of these things from simple lengthening to, you know, we're putting retrograde nails beneath hips that were crow for subluxation dislocations where they've had to sort of fix them high. Lead, and previously our hip surgeons were lengthening them down and causing problems of dislocation and starting nerve stretching. Now they're fixing them as is and we're putting in retrograde precise nails to lengthen below these hip. You know, it's, it's completely changed things, but these are not, they're easy things to put in. Or as I said in my patients, it looks really simple. And that's exactly what it is, something that just looks simple. If you don't do the planning, you're gonna have problems. And we've, one of the reasons Pete and I put these talks together, particularly his talk with the tips and tricks and showing our dirty laundry is we have evolved through several hundred of these cases to discover every possible problem because we've had them. We put in tibial nails where they've bent. We put in tibial nails where the, the precise nail itself has bent. We've put in femoral nails where the screws are backed out. We've put in femoral nails where they've eroded the anterior cortex. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I want to tell people about that so you don't have to. That's very good. Um, Peter, questions come up and perhaps you can answer this one, having had experience with both, um, well, both of you indeed. Is there a difference in the infection rate between the lengthening nails we're currently using and um, external fixator assisted lengthening over a nail? So the old technique where it started with lengthening over a nail 
uh, as opposed to using our currently all inside lengthy nails? So uh, I think that obviously since we've, you know, since eight years, I don't think um, I've used a fixator assisted nailing, if you know what I mean. Um, our original paper did show that there was a far less infection rate with the intermodullary lengthening device over uh, using, should we say, ordinary external fixation. That's the only bit of evidence that we've got for that perspective, if that makes sense. Um, so I can't really answer it because we, because I was going to say one thing that um, I'm, I'm aware of the complications that can occur and we do have complications, but we, we don't have a lot of them. We don't have a lot of significant pin site infections. We don't have a lot of significant soft tissue contractures. We don't have a lot of significant poor bone regenerate. And I wonder whether it's because we are so strict on our rules of how we prepare the patients, how we do the surgery, and how we don't try and push the boundaries too much. For example, you know, if there's poor bone regenerate, we, we, we may say stop. If there's a, a knee that's subluxing, even though you want to go that extra two or three centimeters, we say, you know, I've had a, a young lady, a child, who's got fibula hemimelia and her knee started to sublux. And I just said to mum and dad, look, stop. We're going to let, let everything heal at the moment. We're not going to have a bigger problem. So we, we don't have a lot of infection. I mean, I have to say, do you have any infection? In, in terms of the difference with the external fixation, the fixation over nails, certainly, I mean, the LRS comparison paper show, we yeah. see it's a lot, lot better. But it, it's so different to external fixation lengthening in the femur. And the femur is a miserable place for x -fix, But it's so different that I think the major quantum leap in concept is that you don't need a rod to go the whole length of the femur. So if you've got a let section of obliterated canal or further down the femur, there's deformities. You know, we've done lengthenings in the proximal half, in the distal half, with very abnormal bone at the other end of it. Whereas with a trauma nail, you wouldn't consider putting you know, a 18 centimeter nail into a 40 centimeter femur. Whereas with this thing, you can get away with it. I, I was gonna say one thing, um, which just, I have thought is the lengthening after a previous external fixator and I, there's been a couple there's been a few discussions on the risk of infection of putting an intermodullary lengthening nail into a patient who's previously had a, net, a frame because I'm aware of some people who've had um, infections around that nail because they've had it you know now it would be very interesting to look at those cases and really take a good history of sort to whether there was an infection, significant infection when they had the original frame. Because if that's the case, then they are more at risk. And there's a question of, I don't know, whether it, it's safe, it's a very difficult question. So if I can stop you there, um, I have a couple more questions we'd like to answer before we finish. First of all, um, Alex, um, who's one of our faculty members as well, would like to know, how do you plan your acute correction for the fixator assisted nailing? And how can you be sure it is correctly done during the surgery? Good question. In order to plan it, we of course go to the whole deformity planning course where Mr. Cheresian himself, Professor Cheresian himself does an excellent lecture on this, which I highly recommend to people in the the planning. But it's like I say, it's planning, planning, planning. Delivering that plan in theatre, as Alex points out, is not always the most straightforward thing. But you know, in these days of templating, CAD cams, trauma cams, software, copying things out on a bit of paper, you can always plan where things are going to go. Often you end up, however, in theatres with some polar wires sticking 3.2 thread tip guide wires in various places to sort of drive your nail exactly where you want it. Yeah. Planning and operating so, often. I, I, think there's, I think there's, um, I mean, there are some jigs. I, I know that Minhal Jaudry has, has shown that he's got an, a, a lovely jig to which he puts on the end of the femur to give you the correct uh, alignment, intramodellary alignment. But I have to say, 
it, it's actually quite difficult to be that accurate. And I think you have to accept something. I mean, obviously, if you want to use a hexapod fixator assisted, that at least can give you a little bit more accuracy than just what I was doing, which was just looking at the preoperative picture that I'd drawn and matching that to my image intensifier in theatre. Okay, I think we've got time for perhaps one more. Uh, Dave, can we just Sorry. one more question? One more question is, um, and we'll try and just finish it there. I think we're running out of time. Um, so, do you have an experience of a secondary lengthening with the same nail? In other words, screws out, reverse, screws in, and continue with the same nail? Uh, I've done three of them. Uh, we've written them up. It's, it's in publication at the moment. Uh, three or four. Uh, but basically, yes, uh, these are hideously expensive nails, and we wanted to save the NHS some money. The clinical indication over and above the cost implications, you don't need to retract the nail if you do an osteotomy around the nail. So we take, we've done ones where we've taken the screws out as a simple day case, back the nail up over a couple of weeks. Now the problem is you can't use the rapid distractor to shorten them because the soft tissues are too thick to rapidly distract them as a single procedure. So you either take the whole nail out, which involves assaulting the abductors again in an anti-grade primal nail, or you don't disturb the nail, just take the screws out and back it up and then redo it. Now we've looked at, we published a paper about looking at the, whether or not there's degradation in these, in the nail itself, and there probably are degradation products, so it's not recommended for use, but we've done it successfully. One of the interesting is doing the corticotomy around the nail, which you have to do, has led to the second regrowth being rather deficient in the lateral cortex. They've all united, they've all been uneventful, there's been no problems with the weight bearing and things that usual usual procedures. When you look at the regenerate, it's, it's asymmetrical. It's much more deficient laterally than medially in these. And I suspect that's because you have to go around the nail to get the medial side and be convinced you've got it. Uh, so it's a little bit deficient in the lateral cortex, but it's worked in these three cases without problem. I would say that the, the regenerate healing index is a little bit delayed in the secondary lengthening. Okay. Okay. You're not assaulting the abductors of the hip in an anti-grade nailing a second time, and you're saving 12,000 quid. Just uh, t maybe two short, short ones. Um, do you do nerve releases for tibial lengthening as uh, Dr. Hertzenberg recommends routinely, or is it just on uh, obviously patient assessment and condition and uh, type of lengthening? I've done one in someone who had scarring there previously on a nerve injury, but no others. I don't know you, Peter. No. No, so not, not routine. And, and, um, do, you, do you have a cutoff point of the magnitude of deformity you can correct in combination with a lengthening nail? Yes and no. I did someone who was so severe that I did a trapezoidal osteotomy and actually removed a segment of bone. I then compressed it with a pre-distracted nail and the regenerate was extremely poor and I had to swap them out to a trauma nail. And I think that's because I disavowed Elizaroff's corticotomy principles and actually excised a segment. You know, say so you're, you're taking periosteum and all to do that, and that is not standard lengthening. Uh, in terms of distal femur, I've done some quite severe distal femur deformities. Uh, my preference at the moment, if it's multi-level deformity, is to use a trauma nail, get them straight, and then lengthen. If it's a single deformity that can be corrected in the supracondylar region, I'll lengthen to the same point because it's nice wide, it's metaphyseal. Thanks very much. I think that probably brings Kevin, us just, to the end. Yeah, haven't. Just wanted to update guys that uh, the whole uh, webinar is available on the YouTube as well. So if you go to the YouTube, just type Hull Deformity Course. There's a separate channel. Uh, you can subscribe to the channel and the full webinar in a few days, once edited, uh, would be available for you to view. If, if you have missed out something or you want to go back and check some points or, or some tips and tricks, the whole thing would be available to you. Well, thanks very much to everybody who's joined us today in the webinar. Pete, you want something to say? Uh, I was just going to say that um, we are hoping to uh, have a fellowship here at the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital. So anywhere around the world, if you'd like to come and work with us, um, look out for an advert soon. We're we'll looking, we're looking, month, looking for a limb reconstruction fellow. Excellent. And also to everybody... To everybody, um, hopefully you can perhaps join us next year at the whole deformity course. We have a very exciting meeting for you, including a one-day specialty meeting with a delegation from the
Elisa of Unit uh, in Kurgan, who will be joining us for the day, so hopefully we'll see you then. Otherwise, thank you to everybody who's joined us for the webinar and to particularly our faculty. I think it was a great uh, talk you gave us both. All the information was amazing. Uh, thank you very much. And goodbye. Have a good day.